Here we go. to see more of what I do, check me out on my website, Tom's Train of Thought, where you could find many different tabs, projects, layout updates, videos, and links, and of course, Rumble. So check that out. The link is in the description. And thank you for your support. A lot of things are on there that is not on YouTube. So check out Tom's Train of Thought website. I also do live streams on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. You could find the links right here on my website. And there are other times when I pop up occasionally. Other times be besides the Monday and Wednesday night live streams. So check it out. Hey there buddy, are you doing all right? I'm doing great as a matter of fact. I'm on the road. Yeah.
on the summer night The shy love and the sparkle left to be Stars are lighting and the month time's night burn like the dried out leaves I will leave it on the next train, baby I do believe Come on Let's ride this train Come on Five, I don't hear it in my song I'm gonna pull my weight, don't get me wrong Brand new start and a whole new part They are big old shoes to fill I'll be there on that platform, babe No, I will Come on Okay, waiting for that thing to disappear. Good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year. I hope everyone had a Happy New Year. We're going to be doing Tinkercad tonight, and I didn't make it all the way through the uh, people that said hello. So here we go. Here's the rest of them. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Glad to see you make it in here. I uh, just got a few more. Okay, and one here. And Matt, he says, great music. Everything's on Epidemic Sound if you're interested in in the music. So, all right, who else is in here? I got to go up to the live part. I had all those in the queue. Uh, Elmer, Elmer Jackson. This is Jackson. Jackson Junction. All right. And Gene Jablonski. How you doing? Good to see you in here. Uh, if you have Tinkercad, uh, unless you have two screens... Uh, you could follow along if you have two screens. You could follow along, but if you don't have the two screens, uh, just uh, take notes and uh, follow along. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and uh, we'll interrupt Logan uh, if it's not pertaining. We'll interrupt him if it's pertaining to what he's doing, and if it's not pertaining to what he's doing, then we'll. Uh, Hold it off and wait for a pause in there. So, or, okay, and he also said, or watch watch the video with their phone. Okay, all right. So, here we go with, uh, let me get Logan over here. So, how are you hey. doing, Logan? Good. How are you guys doing? Oh, all right. Happy New Year. Yeah, and, Happy uh, New Year to y'all as well. The, all this time is yours. Uh, awesome. I'm sure we got a lot of people in here. Let me see who, how many people we got in here right now. Okay, what's the thing say here? 
It says we got about 29 people in here. Smash that like button if you haven't done so already. <laughs> I'm not going to put that up there, but uh, go ahead, Logan. It's all yours. Uh, all right. Do whatever you want. And as the questions come up, I'll put them in the queue and, you know, I'll present them to you as uh, when it's appropriate. How's that okay. sound? That sounds perfect. Okay. Um, so, so it's, yeah, I'll... it's all yours right now. Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for Tinkercad. And when you initially log into Tinkercad, it'll bring you to this menu. Um, I'm already logged in, so if I go to tinkercad.com, it's just going to bring me right to that main screen. Um, when you log in, you'll select your either type in your credentials that you did through Autodesk or you'll use your Google. You can use your Google account to get into there. Um, under here, you'll have a 3D designs. This is anything that you've created that will pop up into this design area. Or you can do create design, create 3D design. Um, I have one here open in another window already. So if you guys, anyone that's following along, if you want to go ahead and do create and then tell 3D design, it should pop you into a new window that looks like this. And everybody can let me know if I'll give somebody a second to kind of log in to see the screen. Um, we'll go over kind of what all the buttons are and some of the different menus and some of the basic functions and then a couple of, like tips and tricks to move faster. Um, okay, while you have that up there, uh, I have one question to ask. Uh, is sure. there anywhere on that website that shows all the shortcuts? Uh, there is. Uh, I don't have the link, but you can Google it, and it will bring you to like a, a menu of shortcuts that you can do hotkeys or certain things. Okay, um, that's, that's good. So yeah, I'll show I, you guys yeah, some of the ones I, was, I use. I was trying to name. figure out how you manipulate the 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 work with the right, workspace right there right. without moving okay, the so, uh, cube. So with that one, you do the right click uh -huh. onto the work plane. If you have something down, you don't want to right click onto that because it won't do any well. So you can grab it and move around on the plane. Okay. So anytime you right click, you can move it and then left click to grab your object and move your object. Um, but what we'll start off with just like kind of go through what the buttons are first and show you a couple things that they do. Right. Uh, first thing is you'll notice in the top left on the name it brings you in and it gives these like randomly generated names. It seems, um, if you want to, I would suggest saving your project. Um, so just change the name to something that will help you stay organized. Um, on my personal account, I have like 165 different ones. So it starts to get harder to filter through the different pages of things that I've worked on in the past or need to revisit to print out in the future. So coming in here, the name, change the name to whatever you want the name to be. And then down here, you have your uh, copy, paste, and duplicate, but you need an object from the shapes menu to be able to use those. So what I'll do is I'll pull in a shape and then we'll mess with this guy a little bit. Um, but at some point, just so you know, this menu we're going to use with the different shapes. Um, it'll allow us when we pull some things in here, we can highlight multiple shapes and use like a group and then ungroup. So you can see that they highlight and unhighlight when, you know, depending on the function that I'm using. And then there's a little alignment tool here and you're going to like, I live by this to align things like quickly rather than moving it by hand and then trying to get it like right on top if I needed these things to be aligned. Um, you can use that menu to snap them together. And then there's a mirror menu. You, we can look at like using that later. So if you design one thing, so let's say you, you designed this shoe and then you want to mirror it, but that's actually not, that looks like it's a, uh, not left or right specific so that was a bad one how about this we'll pull the eye in here and even though there's a left and right eye um i can duplicate this eye you can do like regular copy paste stuff or you can do duplicate 
And I'll show you the difference. If I just copy then paste, it just gives me a second one. If I duplicate, it'll actually duplicate the movement also. So if I take this and I duplicate one, it stays in place. You can't see it, right? So it puts a second one here. But if I move it and do duplicate again, it'll make that same movement. So if I have an object that I need to be a certain distance apart and I need five of them, I can I would duplicate rather than copy paste. Um, but here we were going through this menu. We'll go back to the mirroring function. And then I'm going to want to mirror this guy. So that way, now I have like left and right eye. So if there's something that you've created, right? This has left and right in the little menu here that Tinkercad has pre-generated. Um, but you can, if you create something and you need an identical copy that's a mirror image, like a shoe or whatever, you, you can make, put a lot of detail into the right shoe. And then just to make the left one, you just duplicate it and mirror it. And then you don't have to make a second one, right? So that's the mirror function. Um, for import, if you're working with something that you've created in the past, you can import, choose a file, and then um, what you'll want to do is, like, I have STLs for things that I've worked on or created, and I can import this thing in, and then I can work with it so if you have a, a design or something you've created that maybe um, you need like that one piece that you designed applies to multiple projects, you can pull it in and mess with it. <clears throat> and then on your export, um, if you once you've created your shapes and created your model, you want to save it to your computer. Um, use the STL. You can do these ones, but on the STL, it saves it, like this one saves it, OBJ saves it as a zipped file, but the STL just saves the regular file right to the downloads. You can rename it. Because the thing is, when I save this, it's going to save as the name of the project. So like train example, right? So if I make six things in the same project, so go back to basic shapes. Um, if I want to pull other things in and I want to print these shapes, I can select each one and export just the highlighted shape. But if I export it again, it's going to say train example and then number one, copy number one in parentheses. So it's good that once you export a file, you change the name and then export the next one, change the name. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's the export menu. Also, if you need to cut something like uh, for anybody that wants to do laser engraving or has the ability to laser engrave, if I want to laser engrave this text, I will export SVG. And then once I've exported that SVG, uh, you can't see it here. There's a little trick that took me like a month to find on the internet. Um, basically here, the lines are too thin, but it says text in there, I promise you. You have to pull it into another program like Inkscape, which is free. Thicken the lines, and then you'll get this outline of text. Uh, where that works is if you guys are laser cutting something out of wood and it needs to match your design, like whatever you've created, like let's say the base of a house, you want to laser cut it or laser cut some foam, uh, whatever's like not toxic the laser cut you can have that do that for you um or if you want to 3d print an outline of something uh you can do the svg and then pull it back in and have just the outline rather than creating the outline yourself so uh, some of these i'm just breezing through so if it feels like uh i'm getting off track or like a water hose of information I just want to go through this first bit of just explaining kind of the use cases, and then we'll go back and demonstrate some of them. Um, so you have your basic shapes menu here. Um, above here, you have a ruler and a grid. I don't really use this a ton, and you have notes as well. I use that sometimes sparingly um, for certain projects, but for the most part, 
I don't use these typically because when you click on a shape, if you hover over the boxes, the alt text comes up and it tells you, like if you click or hover, it tells you what size, and these are in millimeters. Um, you can change that in your settings. I stick with millimeters, all the 3D printers utilize millimeters. So unless you want to convert everything to inches and that's what you think better in, you can do that in the software. Um, I do everything in millimeters myself though. So uh, one thing on this menu is that you have all these basic shapes. And again, like we talked about before, think of these as like Lego pieces. That's like the best way in my mind for me to see these different things. Because uh, if I use these together to duplicate or create things, so this is the alignment tool I was talking about. If I want to center the objects, I just click and it snaps them to center on each other. But if I group that, now I've combined the two and I have an interesting shape you know if i needed that or i was trying to make some kind of hat out of this like a chef's hat or something or uh whatever it may be like combining if you notice it cut the triangle wedge out of the cylinder right uh, yeah i, I so, see that okay so go over that part again where you aligned them and then grouped it okay yeah uh so do you want me to do that kind of like as you guys have questions repeat or do you want me to kind of do an overview and then we'll like build yeah because like and... when you're when you're explaining it uh you're explaining it like you know uh explain it like uh somebody has not used tinkercad at all before like me sure so my <laughs> yeah my my goal was just to kind of like explain what all these things are uh -huh. and then get into like okay the, the walk through okay uh, well okay i'll ask the pace. questions later then if that <laughs> if, if that's okay with you yeah that's, yeah that's fine uh, yeah, kind of fine. what i was thinking so so but basically right you have just different shapes the only point i really wanted to illustrate was to think of them as legos and that they're additive or subtractive uh i just was aligning so i didn't want you guys to be like, oh what do you do there and then not understand but like now I can combine these shapes, right? And then this is one piece, right? This is one thing. So um, the main concept I just want you guys to get here is to start visualizing what you're building as uh, you can add things together and you can subtract things from each other. So you can kind of see almost a preview here of what that shape would have looked like if they were subtracted. So you have an idea of what you would create when you do this as a whole and then combine the two, right? And you can even see like this dark gray is what's going to be removed from here. So uh, just think about that as we go and trying to visualize like when I did the house demonstration, like very quickly, right? Like this would be a very simplified roof, but you can get intricate and start adding shingles to it you can create your own little shingles and put them all over here and whatever you want uh to do more intricate designs is going to take a long time versus simple designs right um but anyways these this menu is just kind of full of shapes that you can use but you can also distort them right so if i scale them in different ways uh, i can make them oblong I can make them, you know, flat in a pill shape. Uh, undo is your best friend in Tinkercad. So if you've done something and you don't like it, rather than trying to stretch it back to what it was, just control Z or click these little arrows here. Um, but you'll eventually, just like playing with Legos, like the more you do it, you'll start to visualize like, oh, wait a second. Like if I need a little tray, let's say, right? I can make this whatever the height, six millimeters, and I can use this, make a hole, and align these guys. And then now I can remove or group them so that way the hole removes it. And now I've got this little tray, right? So this is just if you can visualize how the pieces interact or work together. I like this blue color. For whatever reason, for me, the lines look a lot easier to see. This is like my go-to color for trying to 
see something if it's difficult for me to see in the program. So that's one little tip. Like this is my favorite. Darker colors get harder to see, right? So that's a lot more difficult to really understand what's going on there, right? So this teal color, for whatever reason, you can see the little shadows better. And um, But so just go through this menu and just start thinking about what these things would look like if I distort them, if I make them more narrow. Like I use this cone, for instance, all the time for doing countersunk screws. So if I'm building something that I need to drill or screw down to something, um, I make this guy for the countersink. And then you do that. And if I make it a hole, right, you can tell this is going to be like a, a chamfered type uh, edge. And so if I combine these now, right oh i lost some audio here okay so um if i combine these you have a little countersunk piece here and sorry this guy was not round let's make him round real quick eight eight um so anyways just the idea here this isn't the how-to part yet this is just visualization right um so i pull this i have a little countersink and if i need the hole to be larger you can manipulate like we said before these objects you can scale it or you can type it in so if you want to scale you just click and hold left or left click and you can move this around and it will scale your object if you want them to be smoother some objects have this bar up here so if I add more sides to my circle, it looks more round, right? So, um, but again, just for visualization, this isn't like the project itself. Let's go five, five. So now I can use another one, use this align. I told you like if I'm sent, things are on center, I'm using that alignment tool here all the time. You click these buttons basically saying center them. If I click this, it aligns the top edge together. If I click this, the bottom edge, right? Right edge, left edge, or center, center. And then for the Z height, it's the same thing. You right click and move the workpiece. And you can see now I can align them to the top. So these are the top edges that are in alignment. So if I group that together, now I have a hole that the threads of my screw can go through and I have a chamfered edge for the head to sit flush. And ideally calipers, you'll want to have your calipers on hand to measure whatever pieces you want to interact with your print. Um, and then one little trick, if you guys want to write this hotkey down, uh, when you 3D print, one thing you want to make sure, and, and DFAM is what we're going to talk about here, design for added manufacturing. This is a DFAM principle. Uh, if I have this and it's one millimeter above the surface, slicers will pull uh, the, the object down to the surface. But depending on what slicer you guys want to use, I'm going to recommend Prusa, one thing, because you can align by face and or it will snap your part to the build surface. But if you're using Cura or something, right, um, which I haven't used it in over two years probably, so I'm not 100%. So I'm, they've probably fixed this, but let's say you're using something, you just want to watch out. Uh, if you're one millimeter above the surface, your 3D printer might not know the difference based on your slicer and setting. So just so you don't think your printer's failing when you're designing, always make sure as like a second measure, put the print down to the ground. Because here's the other thing that'll happen um, in your prints and you won't even notice it. If I want to let's say I, I cut something out. Um, let's make that, yeah, 0 0.01. So you see how it's 0 0.01? If I were to cut this off center, I made a mistake. I think I aligned it on center. Maybe it's not on center. Oh, come on, be off center. So when I group these, when I'm looking at this, 
this might look like it's flat and hitting D actually doesn't quite help a hundred percent there, but you'll have a sliver of material that didn't get cut off by the box and your 3d printer will try to print that sliver, right? That was here. It'll try to print this sliver first and it'll look like your printer didn't print what was over here. And like in the early days, I had a couple of like five years ago when I was first starting, I might miss a little corner or not have something perfectly aligned. And uh, I'd end up going to print and it, it would look like the printer, the print wasn't sticking to the build plate. So just make sure you've always got a flat surface, whether it's a small or large surface and that your flat surface of your part, you can hit the D key. So your hotkey, if I, if I have it up here and I hit D, it drops it down to the surface. So before I export anything, I usually double check. I click it and I hit D. And then that gives me the warm and fuzzy that, uh, that I dropped it down to the surface. So, um, that's the kind of alignment tool. I, I went a little more into that than I wanted to initially, but basically think about just how the shapes interact while you're looking through this menu. So if you know kind of what you want to do, imagine woodworking also, right? You want to use a drill bit to create a hole, and then you can use a larger drill bit to create the, the countersink um, or the way that you would cut like if I was going to use uh, a miter saw and I want to do a 45 degree cut I can bring a box right they start off parallel to one another and then I can rotate it to do um, a 45 or 20 whatever you, and if you pull out away from that snap grid you can do a you know five six degree whatever you need um, but if you're in this ring it will snap. So if I want to dog ear the corners here, um, I can cut that corner now at a 45 because I used the hole feature. This was a hole. These main ones start off as a hole. That, that This is how you cut things or remove. This body will be removed from this. So, um, but anything can be a hole feature. I can put text, right? I can turn that into a hole. I can scale it down and then I can cut out my text from this shape as well, right? So alignment tool, if I want it to be centered, I'll do that. And then uh, the drag click. So left clicking and then dragging is going to highlight multiple bodies that are within this group here. And right clicking again just moves the menu around so i can get a better view and then the scroll wheel this is the one thing about doing this on a laptop that bugs me uh having my mouse i like the scroll wheel for zooming it's just easier for me to use a mouse so i'd recommend using a mouse for this but again i highlight both bodies if you notice this is on the whole setting which means it's going to cut it out of here the stamp it cut it whatever helps you see it if I had a solid, it will, when I group it, it will add the bodies together. So this will make it so that way it will print this up, right? But if I turn it into a hole and then I select them both, now it's going to remove it. And so now we have that text. You can see through to the bill plate there. So when I print this, if I want to do like a multicolor print, um, I could do something like put a background behind this that's a separate piece and print that in, let's say, blue, and then print this in red or black or whatever else, and then you would see that color layer behind this text. So that's that's one way to do it. Um, or you can duplicate that text, have it as... So, never mind. I don't want to get too far down the, the tricks uh, thing. <laughs> let's keep it simple for the basics. Um, so anyways, just two small things, right? Two small examples. But again, think about all these as, uh, components or features that you can add or subtract. Uh, if I want to chamfer the edge, right? We talked about cutting the corner. 
what I can do is uh, 45 here, and I can bring this block. Now, if you notice, this block's a little... They're the same size, so to avoid cutting and missing the corner, I'll stretch it out usually longer than my other body. And then I can select these both, combine them, and then when we look, it's going to add right a chamfered surface here. So uh, it's just you 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 learn to visualize it at some point to how you want these things to be created. And the more that you play with it, the more you understand like how the pieces and see like what you want uh, in your mind before you start creating it. Right. All right, so from um, this menu here, you have multiple shapes, right? So these are just the basic shapes, the basic go-to, but there are other things like on the design starters and you'll just have to navigate and kind of browse around and see what you've got. You know, if you want something like this, it's already pre-made. That If this was part of what my design was gonna be, like maybe this would be easier to start my little house build or, or reference and then I could just fill these walls in or you know um, add a roof to it or you you can get intricate but again you have to think a little bit like a woodworker a little bit you know like a kid using Legos and a little bit like uh, artistically you know what do I want to add for design features but while you're thinking in all those different like trains of thought you also have to keep in mind like best practices for 3d printing um like there's certain things if i wanted to print this pill shape this might be a little rough to print if this bottom surface is too pointed and this print might wobble or fall during printing which means i'd have to add supports and if I add supports, so we'll just use this guy to pretend like it's my supports, right? So if I add supports, when I pull these supports away, this whole surface is going to need to be sanded down. And then it's going to look different than this surface. And so now I have to sand the whole thing. So there's just there's little things you learn along the way um, to how to get cleaner models. I would personally uh, just cut the tip a little bit. So it, again, like if I go into the basic shapes, I would grab this guy, shrink it down, maybe not 0.1, maybe like one millimeter. Uh, and you can change the snap grid, right? So I'm doing everything in one millimeter snap increments. If I want to turn it off, I get much finer control. If you see the numbers there, they're moving in much smaller increments. So if I really want to kind of align something by eye, to like because it's aesthetic or what have you so right now if i want to raise this maybe i only want to take a small amount off but enough that it starts to get like a good flat surface for the printer so i cut it it has a flat surface but what do i want to do i want to drop it to the build plate right hit d and then that drops this down and then now if i go to print this Sure, that side will be flat, but if that doesn't matter, if I can hide that somewhere, like on your layout or, you know, uh, if this is going to be some kind of tower or something, you know, you want it to print well first. And printing well might mean sacrificing a little bit of this perfect roundness. Um, so anyways, just go through these different menus. There are some some silly stuff, right? Some of these shapes uh, are just silly things that I mean, is either made by the community or made by Autodesk themselves. Um, but you can look through some of the silly stuff. For the most part, um, and I don't know, you guys are experts on all this scenery stuff, so this probably all looks maybe a little kiddy to you guys for some of these things. <laughs> like you know very basic so it's usually better to make something yourself it just takes more time it depends what you're going for but um so there are different main structures scenery hardware but what i like to do is uh basic shapes 
maybe some design starters, but basic shapes and shape generators are my two favorite menus. These shape generators do pull in a lot of functional shapes. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw that. I'll do that again. Featured collection, you click more shapes. And then after you click more shapes, uh, I'm sorry, not featured. I was in shape generators. So on here, you want to do all and then more shapes. And then this will let you start expanding the menu to pull in. If they would all populate. Um, so you can pull in different things. And some of these, what are neat, is um, you can mess with, like on here, you have uh, the diameter, top and bottom. You have the number of leaves. So like it will auto-populate, right? So some of these are really neat that you can have it auto create something that maybe you had in your mind that you need this shape for. <clears throat> but if you mess with the sliders, you can see how the shapes dynamically change. So I really like these shape generators and you can get them. So like if I was making a gear, I can type in. So both top and bottom are the exact same. And then that you know, maybe gives me something that I can work with if I was creating gears, but I'd have to mess more with these. So take a look at the sliders, take a look at the pieces. Um, here's a real proper gear there. But uh, you can like, change the number of teeth here, more or less. Let's see if we can go below 11. It might not. Oh, it does. So you know, you have some control. It didn't let me do the slider below 11. But you can change these guys. Um, so basically the idea is play around with it is the main gist of this here. Uh, that's not pulling that shape up for some reason. So, yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you all just to go through the shape generators, go through the basic shapes, start just adding, removing, uh, cutting the different things from one another, and just experiment. See, see what things look like. Um, on the snap grid, you'll want to use this for certain types of alignment or, like, fine alignment, heavy alignment. And then on this menu here, uh, if you ever lose your place, so if you're filling this up just with a bunch of stuff and you have something, you know, that you want to move to. So if you're over here and you're like, oh, where was that part? It's over here. Well, you can, can either, you know, drag with the, I, the center mouse click for me lets me move the work surface like this. So if I click the center mouse button in, but if I want to quickly go there, um, I can fit the the selected shape to my view, which means it'll auto zoom in right to that shape. And then now the shape's centered in my view, and I can kind of look around and take a peek at the different things I've, like the different ways I've manipulated the shape. And then if you want to go back home to the center of the workpiece, Click the home and it'll snap you back here. And then you can zoom in and out here. But like I said, the scroll wheel, like if I'm on a mouse, I'll be, or mouse, uh, my laptop, I'll be clicking these a bit. But I like to use that mouse wheel because one, I can zoom. And then two, I can pull it and move it around to wherever I want the view to be. So. Um, so basically the align tool is like one of your main features that you want to really work with. If I need these to all be in alignment, let's say I wanted to print all these shapes, uh, you can align them in the slicer as well, which might be better. But if you know that I just want to print these four things and I want to save some space, I can align them here. And then when I export, if I have them all highlighted, 
that STL, which is the file that our printers make the parts with, the STL would be all four of these things. Or if I select a single thing export, right, STL, it will just be this one object. Similarly, if I highlight this, highlight this, right, every time I export one of these, it'll export just the one that I have highlighted. <clears throat> um, so I've been doing a lot of talking and there's some more stuff to get into, but let's do some questions real quick okay, just to break a, this up a little bit. All right. I have a few questions here. Okay. Hold on a second. All right. Well, what is a P well, this goes back to the, uh, the last uh, subject, but what's the film, uh, PETG filament used for? So maybe we'll we'll ask those a little bit later on. But the questions I had was, uh, how do you create a shape? So if you have a, a shape that you have on your workspace and you want to put it in okay. in the uh, in that list that's over on the side, so you could go back oh. to it again. How yeah, so um, doo -doo 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 -doo. so your creations, you can create a shape and then you can save the shape that you have highlighted. Let me get out of here. So let me see if I do this one and then uh, create shape. So whatever I have highlighted or made, I'm going to create it, type in the name, whatever I want to call it, and then... A description and save and then you can tell it to lock the part size so let's say you're using a dowel let's talk about some everybody has like the little ikea bookshelves or some kind of thing where you you know the pegboard it it, it has all the holes drilled so you can mm -hmm. align the yeah. the shelves let's say you want to have a peg that you've created so that way when you 3d print those pegs or buy the pegs um you can 3D print your own little shelf for your desk or something, right? Uh, you would save that shape here and then tell it lock part size, prevent scaling. So that way you don't accidentally, like when you're moving it, maybe I go to move this and somehow I don't realize I touched it. And then now I do my design and it's supposed to be 2020, but everything is now 21, 21, 25. Like, I would hate to, I've, and I've done stupid stuff like this before where I've had like a wrong dimension and didn't realize that I, I clicked this, I typed this one in and maybe didn't, it didn't save this one or I didn't click it or I was distracted and I only did one. And it was like such a small thing that I didn't change this back to 21 even, but then looking at it, it looks like fine. And then I'll duplicate it or remove it. And then I'll go to print and be like, why the hell didn't that thing fit? And then I'll measure it my calipers and be like, oh my gosh, it's a quarter of a millimeter off. I'll come back and sure enough, this has an extra quarter of a millimeter. Now I got to redesign it, reprint it. So if you have a shape that you use regularly, um, when you save that shape or create that shape, you're going to tell it to lock the part size to prevent scaling. And then you'll never be able to, or it'll make it harder for you to change the size of that shape. Okay, so but uh, so for future reference, if you have a shape that you want to use over and over again in different projects, can you add that to the library? Yeah, so, uh, if, so here, let's just... You know, So we'll just call it the stretch dome. It's stretched. Um, lock part size, save shape. And then now under your creations, right? So you have, uh, sorry, you have basic shapes, mm -hmm. right? And then you have your creations and then it'll pull up. Now I can pull this out right there. And it's created by me, uh, stretch dome, it stretch scaling locked. Okay. So now I can't, I can't mess with this thing. And you see this little purple around it? Yeah. 
when you lock a part, if the part has that little purple highlight, when you click this, that means it's locked. Okay. But it'll also, so if you, if you like glance past this, when you click it and you're like, why can't I move this one? If you see that purple, because you can, you can lock shapes yourself too. So if I click this shape and this little lock icon, I can stop it from scaling now. So now I can't manipulate this, but if I, and it locks it in place too. So that's the other thing. If I have a shape, so sometimes, um, if I want to put things like add them onto this, maybe I don't want this to move from where I'm applying, you know, different shapes. So we'll just say, I'm going to add this, you know, add a few things to this guy. I don't even know. This is just a random example. Sorry, guys. But if uh, I don't want to take this and, you know, maybe I'm adding these little things around it. And then I want them to be centered. I don't want to accidentally bump this and then have to realign all these. Mm -hmm. I can lock that shape into place. And then now there's no chance that I accidentally grab or move this guy. I don't use the lock feature a lot, but there have been times where I accidentally like click the wrong thing. Or sometimes if things are similar in height, um, like watch, this is, I'm glad we're talking this out because this will bring something. Uh, so let's say this guy. So if these are both the same height, what you'll notice here, you see this? On my screen, when I move it, do you see yeah. how it's kind of flickering? Yeah. That's indicating or telling me that they're the exact same height. Now, if I zoom in and I have different colors here, I can click on uh, certain colors and get a different shape. Oh, that one's locked. Hold on. So you see how it's purple? So it's not highlighting. So I'll unlock it. So I can get the red shape or I can get the blue shape, right? Uh, and another thing is if you use your arrow keys... If it looked weird, I didn't move the mouse, but this thing's moving. Uh, you can align by the snap grid amount by using the arrows. Okay. But <clears throat> um, so one thing, let's say I want this to be a multicolor print, right? So I, I, I just like the way this thing looks. Um, so I combine these all. This looks like one piece, right? If I come into the colors and they were different colors to begin with, and I click multicolor, now it'll show me the, the separate pieces of the design. And that's if you group it. Now, this is more for, like, maybe this is an object in a digital space, because if you print this, it's just going to print a cube, right? It's just going to print the solid color. So turn that off. It's just going to print this cube. Mm -hmm. um, but if I ungroup these... Um, maybe it's kind of hard to see what I'm looking at. So you see how it's flashing? I don't yeah. like the way that looks. If I want to get a preview, I'll come in here, uh, group them, and then change the color to multicolor. I just have to remember, and this might be where my note function, right? Like, ungroup before printing... and then leave a note here for this guy that I need to ungroup that before I print it, right? Um, but this now gives me a not weird way to look at, all right, so if I make these shapes, and I'll show you a little trick here too on how we could like make this an object that would print as two colors. Um, so one, all right, I'm not getting into super weeds with this, but one way is uh, I'll ungroup this, there is a benefit. See how I have the red color? If you can't tell which one I'm clicking, look at the color over here, right? Uh -huh. So this color is going to tell me which object. If it's hard to see from the, the way I'm looking at it, you notice this box isn't changing much, but the color is changing. So this tells me which one I have highlighted. Okay. So one little trick you can do, if I want to make two separate pieces that fit into one another, uh, and it'll make sense in a second. Let's say I want to cut out so the blue fill is all I have left. 
I can click this guy, make a hole, shift, click the blue. Oops, not combine. Duplicate, uh, combine, group them. And then now you can see here, you see how what's left over? It removed the other shape from it. But if you notice, it looks like three different shapes. This is one shape. So this is another one of those things. If I take this and try to 3D print this shape, uh, the, the cylinder in the center will print, the text will print, the triangle will print, but this won't because this is floating in the air. And the printer doesn't know the difference. It sees this all as one shape. Uh, it will warn you, though. The new Prusa Slicer has like warnings that say, hey, uh, there's not enough surface area. You may need supports. So it'll warn you that this piece is not going to work out. But uh, my goal here was to look at a red and blue object that looks like a red square with blue corners and a blue fill, right? So um, what I want to do is take this red piece and duplicate it, right? So you can't tell right now, but there's two of these shapes. See? Now, if I take one of them and turn it into a hole, and then I hit Shift and left-click onto the second object, I can highlight two objects. So if I drag-click, like we talked about earlier, if you look here, it tells you how many objects are highlighted. So I have three shapes highlighted if I drag click. So if I drag click and combine everything, I'm going to get something very similar to what we had before because it's go the, the hole and the solid that are the exact same object in the exact same place, they're going to delete each other, right? Or cancel each other out. Um, so what I want to do instead... And sometimes it's normal. You'll see Tinkercad like recreating your parts. What I want to do instead, and again, we have three pieces, right? We can go blue, we can go red, we can grab the hole. And you use this menu to take a look and navigate, right? Um, did I have the blue piece, the red piece, or the hole piece? Can I get the red? So you can click to find. So I have the holes, what I want here. I'm going to shift and left click on the blue and now i have two shapes so i know and what i do a lot of time to verify i'll pull this away okay i don't have the red one highlighted and then i just do Control z and then that lets me uh put it back to where it was but there's still two shapes highlighted and when i group them that hole removed from the blue but if you notice, I still have the red there, right? So now, if I want to print this guy with a multicolor printer, I can just tell it, select both of these. Or I'm sorry, export each one individually, one by one. And then in the slicer, you're going to pull them in together. And it'll ask you if you want to print them as uh, two separate objects or two separate pieces of the same object. So if I wanted this to be red, and I wanted this little, you know, neat thing, whatever coaster for my desk, then um, I would do all this. Now I have two pieces that I can pull in separately into the slicer. And when it prints, it's going to print both of the, oops, it's going to print both of those uh, together. How my little uh, visual is here. So the idea being, and we'll, we'll, I'll go through that real quickly one more time just so it makes sense. If I need this piece to be a fill piece for my main design, right? Um, the way I'm going to think about it is this was a box originally, right? So if I pull this out, the blue is just, it's just the box. But when I hover the two together and use our alignment tool so drag click to get both do the alignment tool there are you see these three gray if any of these are gray or all three are gray it means it's already aligned on this axis okay. so i'll align this guy here and then now um you it's just two pieces again right you can tell it's the two it's the red and the blue so 
if I want to remove this piece from this piece to just have the parts that I want to be filled, then we just select them, do the alignment here and here. And once they're aligned, I duplicate the piece I want to cut from the block, turn it into a hole, and it's still highlighted, right? So you see it went black. It's still the shape I'm working with is the one I just made a hole. Just shift, click the rectangle, and group. And now it's going to cut this shape that I turned into this hole, right? It cut it from that block. And now I have these pieces that, that go in as the fill for my other shape. So that's how you use, or that's one way that you can remove a more intricate shape from a plain shape and then have them combine, right, to be uh, two pieces of the same print. So you can do like multicolor printing or something along those lines. Do we want to see if we have any questions on that stuff or just move on okay. to something else? Is there any questions on what he went over so far? Because I have a few on here. So uh, here's one that you could uh, answer. Okay. How do you know what's the smallest dimensions that are possible? An HO headlight lens ring is 0.5 millimeters, height 4 millimeters, outside diameter wide and a 0.35 inside diameter hole now can you get okay so those so you can create those in tinkercad no problem um so if i want to do uh, you said 0 0.5 yeah and well i don't which i don't know which axes it was uh but we'll just go here so we'll say the circle's 0 0.5. You can make this as small as you want. You just have to zoom in more to get to the scale, right? So I have this on one millimeter. I can do 0 0.1 millimeter. But now um, it'll be a little bit more tricky when you're moving because it's moving the whole thing and we're zoomed way in. But I can move this to, let's say, 0 0.04 is the height or said 0 0.05 and I'm sorry since we can't talk directly if I'm butchering this and this isn't exactly what you were thinking about but um, so we'll do that looks more like a lens to me so this is 4 millimeters and 0 0.5 now here's the thing uh, what the 0 0.5 is going to be dependent upon is your resolution of your printer um, something like this, I would print as a resin print. Yeah, I think that's Since what he was going at. You could, you could do, it, do it in those dimensions, but it would have to be in resin, yes. right? So, yeah, since we're talking about Tinkercad, like, I just want to let him know, you can create those sizes. So the small, like, how small I'm creating it is, um, it, you can do it in the software. It's the hardware, and this is, I mentioned DFAM, right? Designed for additive manufacturing. Part of DFAM is understanding what machine you're working with and what its capabilities are. So with an FDM printer or FFF printer, the ones that use the plastic spool at the top and they push the plastic through the nozzle, this would be too small. And the reason being is your layer height, and you, you could do like 1.5, or sorry, uh, 0.15 millimeter layer height, which would give you approximately three, four layers if it can do the half millimeter resolution at the top. Um, half millimeter, uh, 0.5 is the excess. So if it can do that resolution, I'm not sure what the slicer is going to do. It'll probably just do three layers and omit that last piece um, because the plastic, when I set the height to 0 0.15, what it's going to do. And let's, let's scale this up. So uh, this brings me to another trick. Since this is small, if I want to scale this up, if I hold shift and then I left click on uh, the Z axis, and you can do it with any axis, but we're going to do the Z. And then I raise this up. 
it scales everything uniformly. So that's one thing that you might end up instead of if I, you know, made this taller and then pulled this in and pulled, you know, that in and tried to get the numbers just right, right? You don't have to do all that. If you want to keep it to scale, you know, proportionally to itself, but increase the size, hold shift, click and drag, and then it moves everything together. Um, so, but basically what would happen in your slicing program, uh, let's here, let's do a little, we're going to create some slices and we're going to use Tinkercad to visualize what the slices would look like in your slicer. Okay. So, um, if I'm, let's see what my dimension I'm working with here. So let's just say this was, uh, you said 0 0.5. Oh my gosh, I fat fingered that one. So we'll make that five. We'll make that five. <laughs> Sorry guys. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll go 1.5 to simulate uh, the layer height of what the printer is going to do. So I'll do one of these at 1.5. I'll duplicate it and do another one at three. That's 1.5 more. So this would be where the second height would be. And then I'll duplicate it again and it should go up a third one, right? So it did the scale that I wanted and then I'll do a fourth one. So now if you can see the, the lines here, one, two, three, and then the bottom line is four. There's four of these boxes stacked on top of each other, right? So what I'm going to do here is click the main object. And another way to do this, that's a trick. If I can't click that thing because all these boxes are in the way, I can uh, highlight all the boxes, move them, click this object, then I can undo the move function and it'll still have this highlighted. So I can click Z and my box is the, the piece I want is still highlighted. Now, in this case, I can look at it from the bottom and click it and it would work where that trick really comes in handy is if you have something that's inside that you're removing, there's no way I can click this because all the other pieces are on top of it, right? So what I would do is move all this stuff out of the way, click this, undo, and now I have the box highlighted that's inside and I can change the size and shape. As long as it stays highlighted, I can still manipulate that piece that's inside. Um, so what we're gonna do is, uh, do, do, do. we're gonna take this object and we're gonna duplicate it four times or three times, so we have four pieces. So I'm gonna take the first one and the first layer here and shift, and I'm gonna combine them, and it's gonna cut one of those. So you see a little line here, right? So one of my four objects was cut flat. So if I pull this out, you can see that it's cut flat, right? So this is just and you can rewatch this again later if it didn't make 100% sense. But I'll take another copy and I'll highlight this box, the bottom box, and group those. And if you notice, my boxes are disappearing and it's adding lines here. So I'll grab the next one up and a box and group that. And now I'll cut that one. And then this one, if you notice, right, the slicer is going to kind of do the same thing. There's a gap there. Oop, did I grab the wrong piece? That one to that one. Oh, no, no, it's too high. So they, they're, they're the same. That's right. Um, you'll see in a second. So if I move that out, move that out, move that out, yep. So uh, we'll change the color. So now this is where using the colors will help me visualize what's going on here. Uh, let's see a darker color for the bottom. <clears throat> oh, you know what? I think I just did this the wrong direction. That's my fault.
All right, that was my fault, guys. So, or is it? Did it? Anyway, so the idea here is that what we'd have is slices, right? You'd have one piece here that's cut to different heights. So you have this guy will make blue, and this guy will make orange. So effectively, when I align these, and we'll shrink one down so we can see the colors better if they bleed too much. Uh, 2.9. And then do this one. All right, so um, you're going to have some kind of stair stepping. It took a while, but we got there. Uh, let's make us look a little bit better. So I'll click shift and I'll drag this up until it looks like it matches a little closer. So basically the three different colors will be the layers, right? So if you're printing this on a small scale and I'm hope I didn't throw everybody off track with that little, uh, snafu in my print there, but the first layer of plastic would be this one ring at 1.5 millimeter or 0 0.15 millimeter height which is about as low as you want to go for fine detail. Some people do extreme with small nozzles and like, you can start trying to do more stuff like that. But this is what an FDM printer would do for that light. You'd basically get three layers and they would be, since it's four millimeters, you said, um, you'd have like 10 widths of plastic at a 0.4 nozzle. It's not quite, it's more like nine, but, but you might have like 10 strings of plastic uh, on the Z going this way. And we'll simulate that by this guy. Do 90 here. Pull that, scale it down. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll scale it down and then we'll make it longer. So imagine that, you know, this is the plastic that it's going to lay down and then we'll duplicate that, move it here. And then if we duplicate it, it's going to keep going, right? So these are our little plastic extrusions. So we're using Tinkercad just to kind of keep learning how to use it. But the, the visual here is that these are the plastic layer lines, right? So these layer lines, you're going to have one layer of plastic and it's going to lay down your lines. And then the blue is going to be the second layer and it's going to lay down these lines. And the orange is going to be a third layer. It's going to lay down these lines. Three layers is very thin. And I, this is all to say that FDM is not going to be the best because of this. There's only so much resolution between the, the height of each layer that you can program or should program with this plastic um, versus with resin, you can do these layers at, I think some advertise, you know, 20 microns. Um, we typically run 50 microns on the SL1S. And so 50 microns now, right, is you can do three resin layers for each one of these uh and and i'll do a thing here where pull this up so there's that and then we'll duplicate that so basically you would have three layers of the fdm plastic whereas the resin would be three times better resolution so you'd have nine layers of resin to make the same object so is that clear as mud for everybody? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, but I, I, I guess what I'm trying to get through maybe poorly is like the idea of thinking. So this is in my head, like how I kind of see this, right? Uh -huh. uh, I, I've seen the printing process. I've seen what the slicer looks like when I pull it in. So I know it's going to show me layers like this, right? Uh, not exactly like this, but it'll show you layers stacked on top of each other. 
and if I know the the um, constraints that my printer has, when I'm taking on that project, I would think about this and go, okay, well, I can only do three layers of of FDM plastic strings, right? And that's probably not going to be the greatest print, especially if I'm making a round object and if it needs to be a dome shape, right? Th this is a solid, what we have here. But if it needs to be like a clear headlight, that's a dome, um, and it's just a very thin wall, then then resin's definitely not going to get it because you can't get the resolution in three layers to make it look like a real headlight, if that makes sense. Yeah. Nine layers in resin is um, – might work. You might have some trouble. But because there's other things to get into, God, I could – blabber on about these things forever down a rabbit hole i'm sorry um the smaller something gets with resin you could have some light bleed if it's especially a clear resin that you're using so the smaller it gets uh the the resin might solidify as like one piece instead of a dome shape but that's not here nor there we're here to talk about tinkercad sorry but uh we use some tinkercad uh tricks to to pull this stuff up okay here, here's one right here please show oh, how to modify sdl files that you have done downloaded thank you okay so uh import feature so this is actually i i completely derailed and got off of what i wanted to show you guys uh so i'll show you two more things based off of this uh one of them is importing so i can choose a file um we did vaguely talk about this, right? So if I pull in this like thing that I designed for a project, um, I can pull this in and if I need to manipulate it further, let's say I don't like something or I want to add something, um, I would just pull the shape in and let's see. I would pull the shape in and then uh, whatever I want to do to it, if I want to fill these in. Um, and so you see that green plane that's there? It's letting me know that it put my shape on the top surface, uh -huh. not, not on the work surface. So if you see here that that's floating in the air there, you can yeah. see underneath of it. So uh, that's a thing that's fairly new to Tinkercad. Uh, if I pull this in on the work surface versus if I pull it in on a nut, you see how it angled? It's on the sidewall. It's on the top surface of that. That's just an indicator to let you know that it put it on top of my model here. Okay. Um, but yeah, if I wanted to, to fill this in uh, for some reason... Like, I could pull something in and shrink this down a little. And then I can start just adding shapes in here to fill this. Um, and then I can color this tile in. Or if I wanted to put holes in it, let's say I wanted to hang this on the wall or something, uh, like we talked about earlier. So we'll hit Shift, click. And that lets me go to both. I can type in eight and then it'll scale both down to eight, right? So it's an eight millimeter for the bolt. And then um, I'll duplicate this and say, I'm going to put two holes and just screw this down to my drywall or something, right? If I want to make sure these holes are level to one another, I'll use the alignment tool. And if we see here, they're not aligned uh, the same height. So, I wouldn't want to cut this out, print it, and then go to hang it and be like, oh, wow, those screws aren't in the right place. You can click this button to do the align. It does the align here. And then um, if I grab both of these, want to make sure they're down low enough that they're going to cut through my object. So now I have the STL that I pulled in. I have some shapes just for simplicity that I'm going to cut some holes maybe i want these holes to be centered so what i can do is group these together and now this is one piece right 
So if I want them to be centered on this object, I'll drag click for both and then do my alignment. So I can align them to center on the whole shape itself. Or if I don't like how that looks, maybe I want them to be centered so that way like this distance from this wall and this distance from this wall are the same. This is where you could use a ruler, right? But uh, one little thing that I'll do sometimes just because I'm lazy, I'll pull the shape in, I'll get it close to the edge and then see if I pull this shape over, how close are they both from the same point on the edge of the model. And if it looks close enough, then I can group it. Or if I measure it and I need it to be a certain distance, uh, I can make this box that say it was five millimeters from each edge. I would put this five millimeters and center them. And then it works better with straight edges. But if I know like I need it to be five millimeters from this point, I'll pull the box until the gray line touches that point of reference. And then I can pull the whole, oops, pull the hole itself to that box. And then now it's five millimeters away from that. And now I know that this is five millimeters from that edge, right? So yeah, you can pull in an STL and you can grab shapes and you can cut things, add things, you know, whatever you want. You can combine two of your STLs together. Um, so if I modified that and then I pull in this other thing, import this, and then I want these two things to go together. Like, I don't know what looks cool. Let's touch that. So we'll do it like so change the design to have, you know, this little thing here. And what's cool about these is like this little box, the reason I did this, uh, I fill these with epoxy and just have fun with it. So I can do like different color epoxy in each one. And then once that's filled in and like, let's say I wanted these holes to uh, still be able to take a screw, but I don't want the epoxy. Like I want a place for the epoxy so it doesn't go through the back. I can add a cylinder to protect the holes. And the easier way, if you already know your dimensions, you can tell the cylinder like what the radius needs to be, what the wall thickness needs to be. But for this quick and dirty example, like I'll just use that and then I'll duplicate this guy, pull it over here. And then just get a good look to align it. And what you can do is make it a hole so you can see the lines better. And then you can manually do that. And then there's other tricks. Like I could ungroup uh, this down to the holes there. And then I could align these on the separate. So let's say I ungroup that. So this is uh, in oh, I duplicated it. Sorry. So this is an individual, right? I can click and combine it with that and align these two. So they're centered on each other. Oh, yeah. Um, so if I click here and do this alignment, now I know those holes are centered on one another. So when I click these and combine them with that tile, these holes now are perfectly centered with the holes I just cut. So I can combine those to the tile. I like my blue color. And then I'll combine these two. It's going to need me to it's going to need me to change my color again. Uh, so now if I was epoxy pouring this, I could fill this all with epoxy and there would still be that mounting hole here. Maybe I want to use like brass hardware or something as an accent and then fill this with epoxy. It's different colors. And then this is my last name, like a tile for Zimmerman or something. And maybe hanging on my daughter's door or whatever, like 
just it, 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 3d printing can be anything to anybody so these are simple and like off the cuff kind of ideas right now but like that's the thing i love about it right you anything you can think of dream of like just play with it experiment get creative and you can end up um coming up with whatever that thing is that you have in your head um one last thing that i wanted to show you guys um is involving import and it's similar to what we did here but what we'll do is uh you can bring an svg in so if i remember where i put it here so if i pull an svg in, this is just warning me that the the size i made it since i made it for a poster is too big um but let's say set it to that's too small let's uh so i'll import this and i have this svg and it's gonna pull in our logo here right and so i had a duplicate so i could make two posters on one poster and then cut it in half and save myself some money but uh if i want to remove like this is one piece right because i pulled in an svg that has two of these you don't have to go redo the svg or delete anything you can just cut a hole and cut that away. And then if you notice the box around the print or uh, the, the STL, oh my gosh, the box around the object here, um, it fits it. It auto shrinks to the size of, of your part here. So um, so for this guy, uh, if I wanted to do this and you know make a little sign or something uh one thing i could do here is align these and again like design for additive manufacturing the easy way the really easy way to do two color prints and not need a module is uh let's say This is black. I know it's brown. It was black. And then this guy, we're going to do white. So um, I have it aligned. I'm going to group these, right? So, so here's one thing I want you to think about. Uh, and this is where the one object works. So I have two shapes. I'm going to group them together. And they're going to turn into one shape and one color, right? So this is how your printer sees the model. But in the slicer, you can tell it that right after I do this surface, I want you to do a color change at this height, the height of this top surface. And then the printer will pause, it'll beep at you, and you can switch colors. So you can do black on the bottom and then white on the top. And when it prints it, you'll have a dual color. So this is where on the color function, if I do multicolor, right, this is one piece. But because of the way I'm going to print it, it shows me what I want it to look like. And then I can see in here that you have the black letters and white letters, and it does the different contrasting colors. So it'll take this one STL, and this is what it should roughly look like when I pull it off the printer. Um, and you can do whatever colors you want. And the colors are dependent on the colors that you have on hand and the colors that you have in the machine at the time. So even if this is black and white, the slicer doesn't know that these colors exist. It's just going to print whatever color plastic I have. So if I have orange in there, it's going to start this bottom as orange, not black. Um, so these so are just... Whatever colors you have on the printer. Yes. Okay. So what you want to do is uh, think always be thinking about like how the printer like what you're going to use the printer for initially or like throughout the design and when you make changes or add things um you want to go ahead and and do it based on what your printer's capabilities are so knowing that i can do a color change and have one model and stack these on top of each other allows me to get a dual color print with just a color change uh here okay here. so uh here we go. Yeah, here's a question here. So by making a duplicate, it leaves the original alone. Is that how I'm seeing that? Yeah, if, yes. Uh, if I do a duplicate and pull this away, uh, if one, 
originally when you duplicate versus copy paste so copy paste puts it to the side duplicate leaves it in place um but then also if i pull it here and i start messing with this guy right then this nothing happens to the original and that's why if, if i have a part that i've measured and the things like are accurate and this thing needs to press fit into place um i'll duplicate and move like the original off to the side play with the duplicate and then if i screw something up instead of manipulating it back to wherever it was or if i realize after like five six seven changes to this part that i screwed it up i'll just delete that one and then duplicate this again and start again save myself a little bit of time fiddling with it right so it, it just depends um but yeah is there uh, any other question i know uh, i've been getting into kind of like random okay, things trying to here. show you the tools okay on the, yeah. on the basic shapes uh you made some mm -hmm. holes out of shapes that weren't originally holes there's only two like a square and a cylinder yep. that are shown as holes how do you make mm -hmm. a uh, any kind of shape into a hole so just anything that you select when you look at the the color section here uh-huh so when i was clicking this to change the colors there's also right next to it's the hole function okay and it just turns that shape into a hole and okay. again you can turn anything into a hole right so i can turn this into a hole and if i need to use this like a stamp right so let's think of this as a stamp so i'm gonna put that upside down i'm gonna drag this guy here and then uh pull this up so one thing i do want to show you uh, i'm glad that we're doing these little things because it pops things i wouldn't have thought about up if i'm moving this so you see how that's a full full block uh-huh it's going to cut the block out and the text out so if i combine these two you should see it remove block and text right uh so you have this lip here if you don't want that lip there then what you have to do is pull it out until you see just letters. Once I actually not want, maybe go one click above just letters. You see how dark that is now? Then if I do this, now it's going to um, have just the letters only. And so, like, I could turn this into a mold or something, right? So I can create a box, duplicate the box, uh we're going to shrink the box and then just bear with me here guys cut a hole and then now if i did this now i can have a uh prusa research mold that i can pour wax or resin or silicone and then maybe i can make little um like silicone prusa research keychains or something right so do that and then if you think of this as like a negative like if this were a mold because 3d printing is good for mold making too right so if i make a mold i need to make this thinner apparently and then where'd you go So, ah, sorry guys. Pull this here, make that taller. So sometimes the you see the white boxes kind of overlap. It's hard to tell which one's which. Just move it to the side, zoom in. And the one in the center here is going to be the one for pulling up the Z. But, um, so if I did something like this, right? And I put this in the corner and i made this a silicone mold that i would pour it would leave a hole here that i could put something you know a keychain or whatever so the sil this is a negative and the silicon would fill around this and then i could pop that off and have you know a little silicon prusa research deal um but again like just think about these things like think outside the box this this would be a very basic mold type 
uh, shape or design. You can get very intricate with these things. You know, little holder for screws. You can oh, make yeah. things for your layouts. You can make art, you know, pieces or something. Just like what mountain ranges. Uh, if you guys want to make the rock faces, you could get creative and come in here and start adding shapes and whatnot. Um, and there's like better tools for this, right? In terms of power and being faster to create, but Tinkercad's a good way that if you do it for a few months, it starts helping you visualize, right? Um, visualize what, like how to see things in, in this 3d space. And then once you kind of have an idea of what things look like, then you can take this guy here. Uh, and remake it in a more sophisticated program and level up to something higher. We you send your drawing or idea for a rendering to Kevo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's Fiverr um, is probably a popular one. You can go in and outsource. Uh, there's good gig work type um, websites, and you can find CAD designers and send them an idea and say, hey, they, here's the constraints. Um, I'm doing it for 3D printing, and ideally, if someone like if you're looking in their their profile, if they say like they design things for 3D printing or they have DFAM, DFAM, then they will be keeping in mind um, what they need to do to the pieces to make sure that they will print on your printer. And if you're extra lucky, whoever designed it might print a test file to verify that what they send you is going to work rather than you telling them after a failed print. Right. So, um, yeah, there are services out there and then there's even companies you could design something and send it and they'll print it. So the opposite, right. You send it to that company and then they will make your print for you. But, uh, so it depends. And some of these guys, depending on how intricate your model is, they, they, might be 30 40 50 dollars an hour and it might be 400 dollars for the model so it it depends is is my answer there um then there's a there's other services like printables if people have already created we have the repository for models um and you can go look for the models and if you want to do what they call a remix I would be careful sharing the remix unless you it, it it says in the license. So let's go to printables real quick. Um, so when you go into one of these models and there is going to be a license. So you see here, uh, remix culture allowed is an X. So if you took this and changed it so it was better or whatever you your custom thing it's not a good idea to repost it on here and say hey look at my model when you change somebody else's but you'll find some that do say you'll have a green check mark remix culture allowed um sharing without attribution allowed commercial use allowed if, if there's commercial use allowed i you, you shouldn't have to ask but sometimes i'll still ask the designer like hey you know, I want to add these with something that I'm making. Are you cool with that? Um, and sometimes they'll say yes. And then you can make some of these and sell them to people or anything that's on here though, you can make for your personal use and throw in your own layouts and, and use for your own hobby. It's just the commercial side. Um, and, or don't misrepresent a design by changing it. Like you do this, pull that into Tinkercad make some changes on Tinkercad and then put it right back on printables and say, Hey, look at my model. Right. Um, just don't do that. But if you have something, um, like let's say, you know, maybe something that you can use, um, like this depot wood. So whatever one of these things, if you see something that you want to use, Oh, that's a kitty train thing. But let's say like this archway, you want to make your own bridge. You can take this, download this specific file. So if you come in here, model seven files, uh, you can grab this side and pull that into Tinkercad. I guess we may as well just do it. But um, I don't feel like logging in at the moment. We'll download this and then pull it into Tinkercad. And then you can 
set up all the archways and you know put your actual bridge across the top and then you know 3d print the components and make it so it's a kit that you can build um and that's another so the the last thing i'll point out that brings up a point when i was talking about building a kit um if i want to interlock two pieces so let's just say i have these two things and i want to join them together and i'm going to use like a dowel so let's uh do that so look this you won't be able to see that part but if i go here change the snap and i use my arrow key i can pull it back out okay um so and the other thing is if you couldn't see it originally and you lost it you can do the hole and you'll see the part within a part so i'm toggling back and forth between holes regularly so align that guy here and then now I'll turn that back here. So now let's say these two pieces need to click in uh, together and they need to fit. A good rule of thumb, and you might want to write this one down, 0 0.2 millimeters or 0 0.3 millimeters. You should try them both and uh, see how they fit. One might be a press fit and one might be a fit that allows you to put a little bit of super glue or some type of adhesive. And it still fits tightly so it won't wobble or wiggle, but you have some glue in between. Um, so what you'll do is you want to cut a hole out that's the dimensions on each side are 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. And I'll show you that here and be the last thing I promise. So we'll duplicate this hole or this, this piece and we'll turn it into a hole. Okay, but the thing is, I want this guy's dimensions to be a little bit larger than the peg, right? And they actually have this feature in Prusa Slicer now, but uh, for your designs, if you want to design it yourself. Um, so like I said, 0 0.2, so I can do one of two things. I can either do the math, and if I want 0 0.2 on each side, I'll add 0 0.4 to this and make it um, 11.56. It'll let me get in the box. 11.56. And then the same thing from this top side. I'm going to want this to be 12.4 because I'm adding that extra 0 0.2 to both sides. And then we're going to center this guy as I make everybody sick there. Um, use the alignment tool to align that there and then align it this way. Group that together. So now... Um, this peg will make sure these guys are in alignment too. So it looks like they're aligned on the Z and the Y. Group those together. So now if I need these to print and align, oh, I'm still in the five snap. Um, we can see that, you know, this hole is cut out so you see that box that's there that shows you that i've removed the hole now here's how i know that i've got a good gap there is that uh you see how it's not gray if i move this back a little bit it'll turn gray that means they're touching because the hole is touching the solid object so because there is um no gray there I can trust that there there's a gap in the design. I can also zoom in and I can look from the top down and see that there's a gap in the design. So if you do that 0.4 millimeters, right? It puts 0.2 up top and 0.2 at the bottom. But the idea is just the, the, the wall thickness needs to be 0.2 from every side of your part 
And then when you print it, um, it should be like a fairly snug like press fit. And if you do 0 0.3, it should be tight enough, but like you have room to, you know, add glue. You can still super glue like a tight fit, but the thing is you, you don't want to put super glue on, start to press it in, and then maybe there's just the tiniest blob on the corner or something and it only goes halfway in and then glues together, right? So sometimes I make it a little bit more of a loose fit because I need them to, to go flush. And so if I need this to go flush, um, I'm going to make sure that I have the gap a little bit larger so I can put these flush and then they'll glue together, right? And then I'll have these two pieces that'll... So if I... You can do this as a joint to whatever pieces. So if I was going to make that bridge, like I mentioned, with like this part here um, as like going underneath, going underneath of the bridge, I would make every mating surface that 0 0.2 gap on each side so I can basically come to Tinkercad, build like the bridge surface and then build whatever my pillars are that are going to hold the bridge up and I want these to press underneath of it. So, um, but yeah, so the gapping, just make sure if you're going to make press fit parts that you do the gaps. So you can use any scratch or made an existing one with many changes. Yes. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm saying yes for my understanding of it. Um, and I would check if you have any questions. Like you want, let's say you're making something that you've seen that another company has out there, um, but you're making your own version of it. If it looks very similar, uh, I, from what I understand, there's a 70% rule, um, but you can check with a, a, a lawyer to, to verify if you want to sell these commercially. And it's like close, but not a carbon copy of theirs. And you want to justify how yours is different um, enough. Like that, that's something you should talk to a lawyer about. But yes, uh, if you make something from scratch, it's your own idea you've never seen anything like it out there. Like you can sell it and make it and, and cross your fingers that no one else had the same idea as you. And you just didn't know. it. Okay. You used the word, uh, defam a couple of times in there. What, yes. what is that? The design for additive manufacturing is an acronym. Okay. And, um, there's, there's some videos on it that you can look into, but basically the, the little, tidbits that I'm telling you like this, right? Uh, that I, I made the gap 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 millimeters wider than the, the part that's going to fit the peg in the hole or 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 millimeters, a gap around the circumference or around the edges. The idea is that I, I pulled those numbers. It's not just a random number that I, that feels good to me. It was a number based on my experience of printing with my printers. If I make them smaller than 0 0.3, they get a little tight for the fit. If I make them a 0 0.1 gap, uh, they probably won't press fit at all. If I obviously, if it's zero, there's no gap at all. Like the peg won't insert into the hole, right? So uh, the DFAM portion of it is. If, if I was doing resin, I could probably get away with a tighter, like a, a smaller tolerance than 0 0.3. I could do maybe 0 0.1 and get away with it because resin has a better resolution. Um, it's on the micron rather than millimeter scale. And so um, it's just you take your machine and you understand what it can and can't do. And there's things called torture tests that you can used to, to find these things. Um, let's see, there's a gap test, I believe, too. So you can find um, gap tests and try to figure out like how tight your printer does gaps before they actually stop, uh, start blending things together. Um, and then there's torture tests that do a bunch of different, that do a bunch of different things um, on your printer. And so you'll have to read like why the author has this test as a torture test, right? You see some bridging here. 
So it shows you how good your printer can bridge. It does an overhang. And these numbers are degrees. So it'll tell you, like, before this thing starts to fail, how round, right? If I'm printing straight up, it does it really well. But if you notice, as I get out further and further here, you start to get blemishes, right? So there's a blemish right here. There's a blemish right here. So that's where you take a test like this and you print it and start thinking, okay, if I'm going to defam my designs, I know that at uh, 80 degrees or 70 degrees of an overhang, that's what this is called, my printer's not going to do it very well. So if that's the case, then I don't want to have my design with any overhangs unless I'm okay adding supports. If I want to do no supports at all, I would never print this steep of an overhang. I would stop somewhere here like 50 degrees, right? So that's where the DFAM comes into play is uh, what is your printer capable of? And you can run tests like this. The the bridging, if my printer's just not doing well for bridging and I don't want to take the time to dial it in and figure out how to do clean bridges, then I just don't have anything. You see how this is raised up from the surface? It's the printer printed these little feet first, and then it's like a spider. It runs the plastic from one end to the other, and it connects these. But if you notice, because it can't squish the plastic together, you have all these little strings. But then the next layer is less stringy, and then the third by the third layer, it's a little solid. And then the fourth, fifth, sixth layers are going to squish down and look really nice again because they have a solid surface to press on. Um, so that's just the, the, the best way I can put DFAM in a nutshell is basically finding out what your printer's capable of without blemishing and then keep your design considerations within those limitations. Okay, going back to the services, you, you mentioned Fiverr. Uh, was there any other ones yeah. besides that one? There is. Uh, Upwork uh, is another one. So Fiverr, two hours. Fiverr's freelancing. Um, there's freelance.com, I believe. Um, yeah, so you freelance.com, and then I just said the other one. Um, Upwork. Okay. And so these these three services, uh, you can you know look at design and creative skills right here, right? And you can find people on these that that you can ask to create models for you, or maybe they have a profile that that's a big. Deal. So and then again. Uh, I would search repositories like printables as well. So like my first thing is kind of like if I'm making something personally, um, I'm going to go ahead and look for, you know, the train thing or whatever it is I need. Does somebody have what I'm looking for? And if they don't, then I move into making it myself. Is it too hard to make myself? Then I come in here and go to Fiverr and maybe ask somebody to design it and make sure that I let them know like, Hey, I'm going to pay you for this, but I'm going to own it. Like, this is my model, not yours. I have all the rights. Um, and make sure you have that like in writing and up front that, that you're going to own the design and then you can use it commercially. Um, but if, if it's not commercial, it's for your own personal thing. Um, and you want to make, you know, mountains, for your layout or you want to make houses or you know the you know you you drove by something neat on a road trip and you took a picture of it you know and then you want to recreate you know some i don't know smoke like smoke meat house that you saw in the middle of georgia or something um yeah are there any beginner books or formal classes? Yeah, there are. And sorry, this was supposed to be a beginner type <laughs> intro. I hope I didn't go too, too far. Um, but yeah, you can go online. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, trying to remember some of the better portals. There was like Lisa and Linda. I think one of them was bought out by uh, LinkedIn. So there's like a LinkedIn learning that you might be able to find there. But I'm sure if you type it in, um, I know there were master class 
but that's like higher level um I'm trying to remember mark rober engineering class who did they use again so studio.com um i think they yeah so you can find just websites that sell classes and look for you know i'm sure quick google search will give you enough uh information about you know classes but youtube right is probably the main one um anything you want to find now the idea is we've talked about stuff you took to, some notes or understand like you know oh one last thing about duplicates i just remembered right now but if you want to learn something okay how do i use uh the rotation function in in tinkercad and then you can like look up specific things but one cool thing i forgot to tell you guys about the duplicate function uh you can use it rotationally so if i want to rotate something and then i duplicate it it will create all the duplicates and then now i have another shape all together right um so you can use that to your advantage or find a way to do that um and it works for all the rotate any movement that you use and then once you duplicate it but remember you have to move the duplicate so you create a duplicate move the duplicate then the third fourth fifth ones will all copy that motion right so the, um let's say i was making stairs here right so that would have been a quick way to give myself some stairs and then now i have like a stair case or you know to put outside of the industrial building next to the loading dock or something right but do we have any other questions because we okay. are getting any other here. questions out there <clears throat> okay i don't see any more let me see let me see some old ones <clears throat> Okay, I told him about the basic instructions on Tinkercat website, but he said it's too complicated for him. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Even the Tinkercad's classes on Tinkercad. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Here, here's here's what I would say. Uh, don't don't be afraid of it. Don't let it intimidate you, and like start thinking back to whatever you do to learn or to play around or have fun with it. Like maybe just come in here and just start goofing around and seeing like what you can come up with, right? If I add these things together, what does it look like? Let me just make some silly shapes or goof around and then start with like a smaller project. Um, build something simple. Build a brick wall. Start with a brick wall. Build a staircase. Um, go from a staircase to a very simple house. Um, very simple house to a simple car, right? Just add cylinders for tires and uh three boxes to have a trunk body and hood and then use the the cylinder to cut out the wheel well and then put four little cylinders on it and like just start there and then slowly oh well what if i chamfered the back portion so the the trunk has a little um slant to it or something you know build the cyber truck that's a very that's something you could probably recreate fairly easy with Tinkercad. Uh, you know, so I would say play around with stuff and kind of see how they work. And if it doesn't make sense, then go try to find a video after you've played with it a little, and and that'll you'll have kind of that hands on, and you understand a little bit about it, but maybe you don't fully understand how to use it correctly or to the fullest potential. And then someone online can help you uh, figure out the rest. But there might be some classes I know, like on shape, which is even more complicated. Uh, there was a guy that had like a 50 days of on shape, and you do a little module that's like five to ten minutes, follow along. So somebody may have something like that for Tinkercad. Um, if not, maybe I can make something like that, just small, every day, like. Not every day, but like release something once a week. That's like just a small, easy project. 
Um, if that's something you guys want to see, I have no problem making some quick like videos and just tossing them online if you can't find it, but I'm almost positive it's out there. So if it's not out there, let me know. Um, and if then I, I can make something to share with everybody. Okay. Stationary <sighs> Dingleberry, uh, search, do a YouTube search on Tinkercad instructions and you might find something on there also. But you just got to play around with it. Uh, what's the minimum yeah, quality I think that's of the best printers? Thing. He suggests both resin and filament. Minimum quality. So you, um, I don't know how to phrase that the way he's thinking about it. Because quality can mean multiple things. Quality can mean like the output quality of the print. Uh, quality like resolution. What we talked about earlier. Um, if you want to maybe update us on that one. Um, yeah. I'm obviously going to suggest uh, Prusa printers. Uh, they're great printers, especially the MK4 for FDM stuff. But again, it's like you have to think about uh, how small and what, what scale you're designing for or building for. And if it's like N scale and below or components like someone mentioned the headlight for an ho vehicle if you're getting that small on the custom parts that you're creating you have to go with resin um and we have the sl1s um and so that's what i'm gonna recommend you guys use but good printers if, to start with that better <laughs> yeah good so, printers yeah, start Prusa. with Prusa printers <laughs> 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 yeah, he's got the name right, right, right over top of his head, Bernard. But the 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 thing is, um, depending on the budget, right? The um, Prusa Mini, right? That that's one of our more affordable printers. Uh, we have the older MK3S that's still for sale. Uh, that one is the same, very similar, if not almost the same quality. There are like the very fine artifacts on the stepper motors make the mk4 like just really dialed in and tight but the mk3s plus still makes good prints i have eight of them in the other room there that i had before i even worked at prusa and they've been workhorses they've done wonderful and now that kit price has come down um so that way it's more affordable it's only like a hundred dollars more than the mini and you can have a little bit bigger build volume it's just not uh, it doesn't have the input shaper that makes it like a turbo printing, like really fast printer. So if you have some patience and you just want to turn a print on during the day while you're doing some stuff around the house or maybe while you're sleeping um, and let it print, then, you know, the, if the time doesn't matter, if you have a period of time that you're going to let it print and it's an eight hour print, but you have 12 hours to spare, like it doesn't matter if it does it in three or five. A brand new Ender 3 in the box. <laughs> uh, I would go to YouTube and see what the verdict is out there. Um, my experience with Enders is from the older generations. And so any of the headaches that I had before are probably fixed by now. Um, but, you know, my thing, yeah, I'm going to recommend the Prusa because the other thing is the quality. So here's something to think about. Uh, it might look more expensive initially. Right. So I look at the price of the Ender. I look at the price of the MK4, MK3S Plus. But one thing you have to think about is how much time are you going to lose over the lifetime of that printer? If it comes to like the build plate is not perfectly flat, none of them are. I don't care what anybody says. A lot of these build plates have small deviations, and you're talking about uh, 400 micron layers. So if I have. 100 micron deviation it doesn't look like that much but it's enough that the the first layer is going to have a bit of a problem so um with our sensors on our printers the way that they probe and and do the the first layer um you get a really clean first layer you get a reliable print so if you have less print failures right i might have spent 400 dollars more up front but how much plastic do I lose $5 a print or $10 a print when the print fails? That adds up over the lifetime of the printer. What's your time worth? You know, if I need to tweak in settings or level the build plates from the bottom uh, and, and run the test and it 
takes me an hour initially and it takes me 45 minutes the next time and like but i have to ch as i change things i have to do this extra work um those hours add up over the lifetime of the printer and your time is money right like everything we do we have jobs we have hobbies we have things we only have so much time so if the printer is more reliable if the printer has better quality um that extra four hundred dollars seems like a lot initially but over the life like this is my my view coming from doing this for five years now like i've already I, I started off i do everything this way and i waste so much money every time my buddy always tells me buy once cry once right and i never listen so i always start oh i'm gonna i'm gonna just dip my toes in the water and i'm gonna get this thing that's cheaper and then i have some headaches i'm like god i'm getting sick of dealing with this okay let me buy the next one up I okay, it's a little better, but I don't like these headaches. And before I know it, I've bought the most expensive printer on the market. And I'm like, oh, okay, this printer's just more set it. Forget it. I love it. Um, <clears throat> so um, there, there is some – you need experience to understand the value is like where I'm sitting at right now because I didn't know these things, and I might not have even believed them if you told them to me when I first started. And I like, ah, I'll save my $400. But then looking back on the amount of time I wasted on the entry level printers, I would gladly to get my time back paid that four hundred dollar or whatever the difference in price is from like if you bought hundred and eighty dollar ender versus uh, you know, the seven hundred dollar kit of the MK four or seven ninety nine or like the five ninety nine kit from the MK three S plus so it's just it, it's things to consider um and i'm really not trying to sell you on a printer right now i'm just trying to say like right now sorry the mk3s is 649 not 599 but um the thing is i i, I it's it's a legitimate um thing to think about there are costs that are hidden and unseen when you buy things that are like the basic of basic and they're not going to tell you that in the marketing right and i'm not poo-pooing anybody's companies it, it just you can only build something so good at a certain price point because of the quality of the components that you have right um and so just just something to think about and there are other companies out there with higher more expensive printers that have great quality printers like prusa doesn't make like uh, the only printer that works for everyone in the world or there wouldn't be other uh, vendors out there. So I think I take your needs into consideration. Uh, my bias from using the printers and working for the company is that they've always solved my needs. They've made my life easier than other brands that I did. I've, I've gone through the gamut of the, the entry level lowest price printers, but even for what they are, they're good, right? The, the Ender 3 is a good printer at the price point that it is and getting in the entry level. It's just a little bit more post-processing I had to do when I was working on my prints than I did with my Prusa, right? And so there's just little things. And if they if that's not a big deal for you or you don't mind seeing some of the layer lines or traces in the way that the, the G-code lays out um, how they do the prints and the travel moves, it might not matter. Um, so just a, a long winded way to say, like, we have great printers. I would recommend them because they took a lot of headaches away from me. They didn't break as much. And that's my experience, right? Uh, with, with the printers that I tested over the years and why I landed on Prusa as, as a staple printer in my, uh, my little print farm here. In, uh, in other words, what's your frustration level? Yeah, if you like tinkering, like initially I was fine with fixing my Ender 3 from five years ago that had all those problems and then upgrading it and trying to make it all nice with the latest and greatest aftermarket parts that I could throw on it. And that was fun to start off with, and it helped me learn a lot. Um, but now I'm at a point where I, I don't have time for tinkering. I know it well enough. I do projects for people, and I sell parts to other businesses, and I, I I just don't have time for printers to go down and give me problems. I need the prints to come out and be reliable and Prusa accomplishes that. And that's why I use Prusa printers. 
But if I was just doing it as a hobby and a project here and there, then maybe it, it, it doesn't matter as much. Okay, going back to uh, the last time you were on here, we were talking about Amherst. Do you have any update yeah. on that? Yeah, I would like to go. It's on my list. Um, I'm trying to put together a little tour of things to do in that area so that way I can lower the expenses and, and make it a uh, reality. Um, so I am planning on being at Amherst. And if anything changes, I will let you guys know. Uh, were you able to contact the... Uh, uh, John, I think his name John, for from the Amherst booth. to see if you could uh, get about flyers or you know stuff. Oh, like that. I didn't. I didn't ask about that. I did ask about the booth, and they have a waiting list. Um, I thought about getting on the waiting list, but this close to the show, I'm sure there's a lot of other people on the waiting list. I'd be fine going in attendance to chat with other vendors, chat with people in the community. And just kind of get to know everybody a little bit more, get to know the space more, understand more about your guys' needs um, and see if we have things that we can help, you know, solutions for those for those needs. So I'm planning on attending and just kind of getting to know more about the model railroad world and and maybe thinking up ideas on how 3D printing fits, you know, with some of the stuff I see there. Um, Because admittedly, I don't know that much about it. I know about the few projects that I've helped people with. But they've always had to explain, no, see, this is why I need it to do that. Okay, now that I understand, I can create that for you. But um, I'm not a rail model railroader myself, so please don't hate me for that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of uh, manufacturers that you, you used to use white metal castings, you know, for the small parts, the detail parts. Now... You know, they're going into um, 3D printed parts. Uh, that might be a, oh, a okay. good uh, good option for you to go up there and, you know, take a look at some of those manufacturers that have the kits and see yeah, you know, what you yeah. can learn from them. Yeah, if uh, any of you guys know people and I meet you at the show, like, feel free to come up and talk to me. And if you have anybody that that you can introduce me to that may be someone that, wants to know more about 3d printing and if i have any information that i can provide them i'd love to <clears throat> okay hey, anybody else have any questions here we'll give them a few minutes uh i really enjoyed this uh it was very <laughs> i learned a lot a lot of it still went over my head, but, <laughs> yeah. but I'll have to play around with it for a while. Yeah, we'll we'll get you guys there, slow and steady. <laughs> um, and I think there's just, in my mind, I see such a use case for your guys' community that like these tools can help just with that super customization, right? And I've heard from the, the small amount of people that I talk with in the space and the few shows that I've been to, it seems already like there's a theme that um, the people that manufacture parts, like everybody's tastes are so wildly different that you can't find everything for your layout on the open market. And there, that that's why there's so many crafting videos or maker type videos of you guys having to learn how to do some, whether it's mold making or some type of plaster of Paris or something yourself to bring your idea to life in the way you envision it. And I think learning how to model or finding somebody that is good at modeling that can make a model for you to print out like would make things a lot easier because you could get it like 90% of the way there or 95% of the way there. And then you can do the post-processing and painting and what have you. to. But it, it's a little simpler. I would say if someone, if you can find someone to make the model and you can 3D print it, learning how to use a 3d printer with a tried and true model is way easier than um i think learning the skill of molding like like making or not molding i'm sorry sculpting and like being able to do, i've tried some of that stuff and i just have two left feet when it comes to drawing and sculpting and things like that but for 3d printing i'm not as artistic but i can use modeling to make things that I want that I could never do before by hand. And then you think about the recreation, getting the same thing to look the same way all the time. So 
um i think yeah 3d printing's a good tool to have so <laughs> yeah sorry everybody if I, I i get into the weeds and go off on tangents <laughs> too much i'm sorry <laughs> I think a live Zoom class would be good. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, then I did if if they don't if they don't know um that uh I sent you the document. If there's anybody here that wasn't on the previous one, there's like the little how to kind of do, uh PDF that maybe you can share with them or reshare. So if anybody can email Tom if you don't already have it. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, anyone that's interested, go to uh, workbenchwednesday at gmail.com. Oh, there you go. There you go. And uh, let me know if you want that document, and I'll send it to you. All right. So I don't see any other questions here. Okay. So either I satisfied everybody's knowledge base totally and they feel confused. like pros, or I've confused the hell out of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. All righty. Uh, uh, like thank you for coming in. I really appreciate you coming. Uh, look forward to seeing you again. I'll, we'll be up in Tallahassee uh, in June. Oh, yeah, and I'll be there for sure, too. Okay. I'll have a booth there for sure. <laughs> okay. is, is there any other train shows that you that are you going to in the Florida area? Um, I think right now the Amherst is the biggest one on my list. Um, but if I get good recommendations, I know from the last one I went to in Plant City, they were saying that there's one for like uh, more of the industrial side of model railroading in Cocoa Beach, I think they said, or somewhere down in that area. Uh -huh. And so uh, I was going to look into that one as well, but uh, by all means, email me. And if I can fit it into my schedule and it, it makes sense to go there with a booth or to hang out or to get to know people. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. All righty. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to yeah. end it here. I'm not going to do uh, after party on rumble because this has <laughs> been uh, a little bit over two hours so far. So Sorry. Uh, we'll see you, Logan. I'm going to put the end screen up here. I'm going to do the thank you before I put the end screen up there because i got to thank everybody that supports this channel. So thank you All very right. much, Logan. I really appreciate it. And everybody's saying that uh, – or let me put these up in the chat here. <laughs> what they've been saying. Uh, boom, boom. There we go. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. All right. Okay, there we go. And one more. Here we go. Any more? Okay. So thank you very much. I'm going to put the uh, my thank you up there. See you, Logan. Uh, and I'll talk to you again you some other time. Okay. Really appreciate All it. All right. Yes, sir. Have a good bye night, bye. everybody. Okay. Bye. Oh, I froze up. <laughs>
Thank you for your contributions during the live stream. I really appreciate it. I would also like to thank all the moderators who have helped me out in the past years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like that guy says, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you again on Monday. Uh, don't forget to tune in Thursday morning and Thursday evening for some live streams. You know where to go. And uh, we're going to put the swirly smoke on there. Uh, and we'll see ya. Engineer, where are you headed? Carry me back to Tennessee. Oh, I got a little girl who's been waiting. Promise that she's married. Mr. Kane. I'll shovel coal, Lord, to pay my fare. Gotta get this train down to the station. My little girl waiting for me. Well, the night is dark, and Lord, it's cloudy. I've been traveling it lonesome road. My one true love. Here's the swirly smoke, and here it is. All right. Train, 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 won't you carry me home? Good night, everybody. We'll see you again on Monday and on the other live streams, wherever you are. Thank you and good night.